Okay. So hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us today in another session of Fusion Breakthroughs. For those who missed the previous sessions, I'll put the links on the chat and on the comments box, depending on whether you're watching us live or on YouTube. But before we begin today's session, let me congratulate, congratulate the team at the US DOE Lawrence Livermore National Lab for the memorable, <laughs> memorable achievement announced yesterday. Scientific energy gain in a fusion experiment that was extraordinary. So now, many thanks to our speakers today for their availability. Uh, Dr. Katsumi Ida, Executive Director of the LHD Project, Dr. Siwoo Yon, Director of K-Star Research Center, and Dr. Dave, David Gates, Chief Technology Officer at uh, Princeton Accelerators Incorporated. I am Matteo Barbarino uh, from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Today's session features uh, recent results achieved at the Large Helical Device, or LHD, in Japan, at K-STAR in South Korea and studies on simple dipole arrays to simplify the design and production of stellarators. So recently at the National Institute for Fusion Science in Japan, physics experiments on plasma turbulence and instability have provided important insights for developing control methods in the LHD. At the Korea Institute of, of Fusion Energy, uh, several studies published in 2022 reported uh, great results and some experiments at K-STAR were able to produce a plasma fusion regime that satisfies power plant's performance requirements, including high temperature above 100 million Kelvin and sufficient control of instabilities to ensure steady state operation on the order of tens of seconds. In addition, recent, recent progress has been made in designing permanent magnets as an approach for achieving desired magnetic fields with simpler coil geometry in stellarators. We're about to hear about these three topics. The format will be a sequence of three talks, 30 minutes each, Type your questions and comments into the chat box, and we're going to go through your questions during the 30 minutes Q&A at the end. So now, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Katsumi Ida, Executive Director of the LHD Project at the National Institute for Fusion Science in Japan. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so let me start the... Uh, presentation, can you uh, see my uh, slides? Uh, not yet. Oh, not yet, sorry. Um, it's coming? Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, Today I will uh, um, <clears throat> present the recent uh, LHD experiment. And the title of my talk is Academic Research on the Turbulence and the Black Instability of Isotope Mixture Plasma in helical, Large Helical Device. So uh, um, this biograph uh, summarizes the, uh, the recent uh, change of the strategy of LHD research. And from uh, uh, last year, we are focusing the uh, experiment on the basic uh, plasma physics issue for solving the uh, uh, future problem of uh, burning plasma, as well as the current issue in toroidal plasma. For example, the uh, current uh, issue of toroidal plasma is one of the important issues in the uh, prevalent transport study and also the transport uh, improvement. And for this issue, uh, we are encouraging the uh, international uh, collaboration. And today I will give a few examples of a very, very good uh, international collaboration uh, result. And for the uh, future issue of the burning plasma, today I will pick up uh, three issues. One of the issue is the reduction of a diverter heat load. The question is how we reduce the uh, diverter heat load because the higher uh, heat load of the diverter uh, plate would be the problem because uh, we cannot frequently replace the uh, diverter plate. And the other issue is uh, for uh, alpha channeling or how uh, we can heat the ion um with alpha particles so that is the second issue and the third issue is how we can exhaust the helium ash so the 
basic plasma physics issues for uh, this uh, future program is uh, one is the turbulence splitting, and that found the turbulence splitting is a useful tool to reduce the diverter heat load. And for the IO heating, recently we found a wave of particle interaction through uh, inverse and under damping at the abrupt event. So we can evaluate how much is the energy transfer from the uh, energetic particle to bulk ion without collision. And the third topic is the uh, ion mixing in the isotope mixture plasma because uh, we need uh, effective or uh, uh, efficient uh, mixing process uh, to exhaust the helium, which is produced by the uh, fusion reaction. So uh, this is a highlight uh, of today's presentation. For the turbulence transport, I will uh, introduce the LHD and the Bender Science 7X comparison experiment and bottle powder injection and I stop effect. The uh, turbulence splitting, uh, I will show the uh, impact to the diverter heat load and also the first turbulence uh, splitting. And third topic is wave particle interaction. Uh, uh, especially, I would like to emphasize mass dependence of collisionless energy transfer. Then the uh, last topic is the ion mixing. And right, right uh, <clears throat> graph show the uh, fraction of uh, uh, international uh, collaboration and domestic collaboration. And this is how many uh, uh, proponents for uh, LHD uh, experiment last year, and one third of uh, a proponent is uh, international collaborators. And in fact, the uh, proposal from the collaborator exceeds 50% of the total. Okay, so a transport characteristic. So the, uh, <coughs> we, uh, study the impact of magnetic field configuration on the uh, turbulence uh, with the collaboration the uh, IPP uh, Greisbart. And so uh, this is a result of the comparison the LHD and the Wendelstein 7X. And compared with the uh, neoclassical transport, Wendelstein is uh, strongly uh, suppressed of neoclassical. So the Wendelstein is a low neoclassical and compared with the Wendelstein, LHD has higher neoclassical transport. And what is interesting is that we see a difference of the turbulence transport. For example, and this is the uh, calculation, the right figure show the uh, calculation and uh, uh, how much is the uh, heat flux due to the uh, turbulence. And the Wendelstein ITG is uh, higher than the LHD ITG. So in other words, in terms of the ITG, the LHD is, uh, ITG is suppressed. But on the other hand, if we compare the ETG, the LHD uh, heat flux contributed by ETG is, is larger than the Wendelstein 7X. So the, even the, uh, the stereolator configuration, depending on the uh, detail of uh, magnetic uh, configuration, the, um, the characteristic of the turbulence is quite different. And this has been uh, published by uh, uh, Warmer, Flex, Warmer, and PRL last year. And we also have studied the mass dependence of uh, uh, electron ITB, and the right figure shows the uh, the electron temperature profile with ECH for deuterium in the top and for hydrogen in the bottom. And we found the uh, difference of the threshold power, threshold power for ITB. In other words, in the deuterium plasma, threshold power is lower. So if we compare the marginal, marginal power, we see a a significant difference between the deuterium and the hydrogen. And we also have a uh, threshold uh, power experiment for the mixed plasma. 
the other interesting result is um, we uh, have a uh, we apply the uh, off axis ECH and uh, produce the hollow temperature profile, and that is the uh, a bit unique in the uh, accelerator or LHD, and in many cases tokamak show the uh, so called the uh, heat pinch, and in other words the uh, even the off axis heating. At uh, electron temperature is sometimes peaked. But in LHD, we see a hollow profile, and also uh, we do the modulation experiment and uh, try to get the uh, temperature gradient and heat flux, so called the flux gradient relationship. And what we found is the uh, clear hysteresis uh, of uh, gradient flux gradient relation, and also uh, at the uh, zero uh, temperature gradient, we see a finite. Uh, uh, Heat flux. So uh, that is the um, outward heat flux uh, is observed clearly in the LHD experiment. And for the transport improvement, um, so this biograph shows the uh, uh, boron powder experiment uh, with a collaboration in the uh, PPPL. And uh, we uh, drop the uh, uh, boron powder from the top of the machine, and then uh, we see a significant uh, increase of uh, electron temperature and ion temperature. So uh, this biograph shows the uh, comparison with the reference. Reference means the no boron powder. Okay, the both the electron and ion temperature is increased, and if we uh, look at the uh, fluctuation, the characteristic more in detail, and by uh, applying the uh, boron powder, the uh, fluctuation the around uh, uh, 20 or 30 kilohertz range, that would be a low frequency range, that frequency goes down. And so uh, uh, this is also the good uh, collaboration uh, experiment uh, with BPPL. And we also uh, study the uh, so-called the uh, core edge coupling. And this is an experiment with uh, diverter pumping. And so one can expect the uh, diver, uh, diverter pumping and uh, reduce the uh, neutral and edge neutral. And we compare the uh, effective uh, thermal, thermal diffusivity. And what is, what's happening is we see uh, almost no difference uh, at edge thermal diffusivity or no impact of the uh, diverter pump, but we see a core uh, improvement with diverter pump. So uh, this is the uh, uh, clear evidence of uh, edge core transport coupling. In other words, when we reduce the uh, recycling, then uh, we see uh, improvement in the core region rather than the uh, uh, edge region. Okay, then the, uh, the next issue is the reduction of the peak heat load. And this is an experiment uh, with magnetic island uh, self-regulated oscillation. So uh, the top picture shows the time evolution of a magnetic island size. So magnetic island become uh, uh, big and small and show the oscillation. And also the uh, uh, interaction with bootstrap current, the, this oscillation uh, is self-regulated. So in other words, in terms of the uh, uh, operation uh, uh, that is a steady state, but the magnetic island itself uh, has an oscillation. And at the same time, we see a, a clear reduction of a heat throat at the diverter plate. So the right figure shows the uh, relation between the diverter peak heat throat as a function of island expansion rate. So the, when the island becomes B, then the uh, diverter peak heat throat is reduced. So uh, uh, this is the uh, experiment, the uh, uh, magnetic island contributes to reduction of uh, heat load through the uh, detachment. The other experiment is um, the impact of a turbulence spreading on the heat load. So uh, in this experiment, and uh, the top figure show the uh, turbulence, uh, fracture, turbulence uh, amplitude contour, this is time versus space, and 0 0.48, that is the last cross flux surface. 
So uh, when the magnetic fluctuation appears, then uh, we see uh, turbulence are spreading from core region to the outer region in the stochastic layer. And so uh, uh, when the uh, turbulence spreading occurs, then the uh, edge, in, edge uh, density fluctuation is increases, but associated with the increase of uh, edge uh, density fluctuation, we see a uh, uh, deduction of uh, diverter peak heat load like this. So, and this is also the accompanied with the broadening of the heat load. So uh, the bottom figure shows the full widths of half maximum of the diverter heat load. So uh, as uh, uh, fluctuation increase, the uh, uh, we see a broadening of the heat load at the uh, diverter plate. So this is also the another useful tool or mechanism to reduce the uh, uh, peak heat load on the diverter plate. And also the turbulence are spreading. What we found is a very first uh, turbulence are spreading uh, or radial propagation of the turbulence. And it, usually the uh, so-called the avalanche model predicts the uh, simultaneous uh, radial propagation of the heat pulse and the turbulence. In other words, the speed of the heat pulse is the same of the uh, uh, propagation speed of the turbulence pulse. But in this experiment, we found the uh, turbulence uh, pulse uh, propagated uh, six times more than the heat pulse. In other words, the heat pulse propagate is uh, more or less, more or less uh, what we expect from avalanche model, but uh, um, turbulence uh, propagation is much faster. And this is also the quite uh, interesting phenomena. And uh, <coughs> one, one of the possibility of a first propagation would be uh, um, turbulence, turbulence, uh, uh, high K and low K uh, turbulence are coupling. Okay, then the, uh, I would like to move on the next one, the uh, uh, interdisciplinary research and here, I would like to show you the direct observation of random and transit time dumping and also the collisionless energy transfer. <coughs> so the random dumping is a well-known uh, mechanism. So the, uh, the particle which has the um, slightly higher energy of the resonance with the energy and the particle with a uh, lower phase velocity has gained the energy. And at the end, the uh, net energy uh, flow is from wave to the particle. That is so called the uh, random dumping. And right figure show the uh, cartoon uh, of uh, ion uh, velocity uh, distribution and the resonance uh, phase velocity. <coughs> resonance uh, phase velocity is uh, uh, plotted in green. <coughs> and due to the uh, random dumping and the, the population of a higher velocity increase and the population of lower uh, velocity decrease. So if we take the difference uh, between the uh, uh, max variant distribution, we see a uh, uh, so-called the bipolar signature. And that is uh, expected in the uh, uh, Randall dumping. So, well, uh, in fact, we observe uh, this uh, <coughs> bipolar structure. So, uh, the left figure shows the uh, time evolution of this discharge, and um, we see a drop of a neutron associated with uh, MHD pass like this. And what we found is increase of uh, second moment of um, ion velocity uh, uh, distribution. The second moment is the uh, uh, correspond to the energy. Okay, and if we look the uh, ion velocity distribution more in detail, and <coughs> that deformation appears only a parallel to magnetic field, not perpendicular to magnetic field, and also the uh, localized at the 0 0.79, uh, uh, where the uh, uh, wave is excited. And if we take the difference from 
before and after the uh, birth, we see a very, very clear the uh, bipolar signature. And then uh, we can uh, evaluate how much is the <laughs> collagenous energy transfer and from uh, uh, deduction of neutron, neutron, we can calculate how much of uh, uh, energetic particle uh, lose the energy or transfer to the MHD uh, wave. Then the, from the uh, carbon impurity and bulk, impu bulk ion, and uh, since we measure the ion velocity distribution by integrating the uh, uh, the population the, along the uh, velocity, we can evaluate how much is the energy. So uh, the top figure and second figure is how the ion velocity distribution change associated with burst. So at the resonance, in this case, resonance is 200 kilometer per second. And the, uh, we see a uh, uh, deformation of ion velocity distribution at the same uh, uh, resonance velocity. And we can evaluate how much is the gain. Gain is the increase of the energy. So for the carbon and the uh, energy gain is somewhat 20% and <coughs> for the bulk ion, that is like a 5% uh, energy gain. <coughs> so we see a uh, uh, significant uh, uh, difference or mass dependence of uh, uh, energy transfer from the wave to the uh, carbon and the bulk ion. That is because the uh, in the case of the carbon, the resonance velocity is close to the uh, thermal velocity. However, in the bulk ion, the thermal velocity is much higher than the resonance velocity. So the, depending on the slope and the efficiency is higher in the case of the uh, carbon impurity. And that this result uh, uh, suggests the uh, the collision this uh, energy transfer from a uh, wave to uh, ion, for, for instance, the alpha channeling should have a somewhat uh, isotope dependence. In other words, um, the heavier ion has a higher efficiency uh, for uh, collisionless energy transfer. <coughs> okay, the last topic is that. <coughs> ion mixing. And this is an experiment of isotope mixing in LHD. And uh, I showed the two uh, uh, profile of deuterium and hydrogen. And in both cases, if we compare the electron density profile, that is almost the same, almost identical. But uh, in the non-mixing case, uh, we have a fixed helium density and follow uh, due to the density. And peak of the helium density is due to the helium beam failing and follow uh, density deuterium is due to uh, uh, recycling from the wall. But when the isotope mixing occurs, regardless the uh, uh, source and the hydrogen and deuterium profile become same. And that transition is related to the, uh, so, turbulence state, whether that is TEM dominant in or ITG dominant. So uh, in the case of ITG dominant, we can expect the uh, isotope mixing. And when the TEM is dominant, we expect the isotope uh, non-mixing. And we also see a <coughs> transition. This is the time evolution of electron density and electron temperature. And in this discharge, the, uh, uh, this is the close to the density limit. So the final uh, plasma uh, is uh, a collapse like this. The temperature significantly de decreases like this. And in this discharge, we see a clear the uh, transition from uh, isotope uh, non-mixing to mixing. This is hydrogen fraction. So you see a hydrogen fraction is higher in the core region and lower in the near the edge. But at the end, so the uh, ratio is almost uh, uniform. And right figure show the uh, electron temperature and ion temperature profile and um, fraction of hydrogen. So uh, 
in the non-mixing state, the hydrogen is peaked and the deuterium is hollow. However, when, in, when the uh, isotope mixing occurs, the ratio is almost a constant in space. So uh, uh, this is the evidence of uh, uh, isotope mixing occurs and uh, uh, when the density uh, increases or towards the uh, density limit. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, conclusion. So a uh, significant uh, progress in the scientific research has been made in the experiment on turbulence, transport, and island, and uh, energy particle. <clears throat> and related the experiment provides the following uh, important uh, observations. Uh, role of turbulence uh, splitting and core edge uh, diverter coupling and non-diffusive uh, transport and the interaction between the magnetic island and the transport and the rundown and transit time dumping. So, uh, our, however, our knowledge of these issues is limited. So, uh, um, therefore, a further study using LHD a sophisticated diagnostic is necessary uh, for a comprehensive understanding for the observation of work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ida san. We have a question already on the chat, but we'll take it um, after the other talks. So, yeah, just uh, this is a list of the uh, recent uh, press release. Just I leave the uh, advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very helpful. Oh. So now we go. Uh, we welcome Dr. Si Woo Yeon, director of K Star Research Center at the Korean Institute of Fusion Energy. What? Can you see my screen? Yes, we see we see us. We see ourselves <laughs> on the web. App. I don't know why. It it works previously, but not now. Uh, do you want to try to open the share, share the PowerPoint? You see the slide? Yes, we can see the slide. Okay, then let me let me start. Okay, so today I would like to introduce recent result of K-Star. I mean, I'm. Ah, uh, see what? Could you? Yeah. Can you go full screen? Yeah, it is full screen right now. But no. No, not for us. Hmm. Okay. Oh, I don't know why, why it doesn't really works. <coughs> How about this? Uh, we don't see full screen. We see, uh, we basically see the PowerPoint, but without going full screen. I don't know if you can, and you, there's a, if you go full screen, what happens? Yeah, I, I did the full screen, but it, because I share, I'm sharing the application window. Oh, okay. Okay. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, but if you, if you click on the bottom, on the bottom, right, the full screen icon. On the bottom right, next to the magnifier, the plus or minus, there's. Yes. Yes. OK. Oh, nothing happens. <laughs> OK. I don't know why. I mean, it, 
it just worked previously and it doesn't right now. Maybe because previously you were sharing the screen and now you're sharing the application. Yeah, I try, I'm trying to share in the screen. But... So I'm trying to share the screen. Yes. And try to go to the PowerPoint. Okay. So is it working right now? Yes, yes, great. Thank okay, you. Okay, so then let me start with uh, my presentation for the recent case star result. Okay, so let me talk shortly about what case star is aiming at. So the mission is quite clear that the, the machine like case star is to explore the science and technology for the high performance steady state operation, which is most important, I mean, part of, of the future demo. And so we are going to do, do the, some steady state high beta operation development and also the instability control and also try to understand some fundamental processes in this uh, the high beta discharges and also touch up, touching upon the uh, engineering and technological issues. Yes, k is a, a, a mid-sized superconducting tokamak. So, and also beyond, we have, a, I should say, we have, a, a, there are unique capabilities for physics and engineering research for K-star. First of them, first of the one is that we have a better plasma symmetry, which include the low lip, uh, lipper and also low air field, and uh, also better controllability with imbecile control coils is quite flexible and reliable uh, uh, system. And also we have a, a fairly good imaging diagnostic to look at the dynamics and the structures uh, in, in some details. And also we have a fairly good uh, MBI system, which is fairly tangential and it's very efficient for the current drive and also the rotation drive. So based on this capability, KSTAR has been doing up to now, there are several, I mean, milestones. In 2021, we got the uh, high temperature plasma sustainment up to 30 seconds. So in this talk, so I would like to address uh, uh, several topics, starting with the scenario development, which will include the high internal inductance scenario, and also the internal transport barrier with I mode edge is so-called fire, a fast ion uh, regulated mode. And second topic is MAT instability. So I'm gonna to explain the, the control of the edge localized mode with the legend magnetic perturbation, which is, uh, I mean, very important technique for ether and future reactor, and also the disruption mitigation with the multiple shattered pellet injection. And thirdly, about the fundamental physics, so I shortly address the self-organized structure of the electron temperature, so-called the profile corrugation, and also the turbulence spreading near the magnetic island, and also the uh, key mechanism for the density pump out by the legend magnetic perturbation. I shortly uh, talk about the virtual platform at the end. So starting with the scenario development, this high LI scenario has a uh, uh, it's pitch and pores. It has a fairly picked current profile and due to the strong magnetic shear that we have a, a better confinement than the conventional uh, shear plasma. And uh, we actually used optimized ECCD and MBI mixture so we can get the fairly high level of better normalized with uh, LI, LIs around one. And then this uh, scenario provide a, a good candidate for the steady state high beta scenario. And the, uh, in terms of fusion gain, it's fairly high in the Q95 around four. So it's quite an attractive scenario for, for uh, ether steady state and also the future demo machine. And, uh, and actually the long first capability of this mode has been, I mean, explored. And with the beta normalized 2.8, we can, we, uh, successfully sustain this mode more than uh, uh, 20 seconds. And it is really, really, uh, I mean, long compared with the uh, uh, 
can relaxation time and the error is sustained steadily above one. So this is uh, a guarantee of uh, this mode can be, I mean, extrapolated to the uh, more uh, steady state and uh, longer course and with a uh, 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 high beta at the same time. So when you look at the, some simulation, I mean, predictive modeling based on the uh, on the radial transport, and we as you compare here the the measured profile and the simulated profile uh, looks very similar, except for the uh, some deviation at the center for the for the rotation, but the others are used, are in, fairly in good shape. So I think we understand that the uh, basic transport. Uh, by this model, and this is, uh, I have to emphasize that this one is uh, based on the uh, strong uh, magnetic shear part of the uh, turbulence suppression. And next scenario is uh, uh, internal transport barrier, which is quite straight, uh, stationary at high ion temperature. And it actually got the, the ITB mode with the Diverted L mode edge starting, and also it can be uh, uh, also extended to the I mode like pedestrian structure, also. So it also uh, gave us uh, additional gain in the performance. And basically, the performance itself is quite similar to the that of the H mode. It, and without M's, of course, it's L mode edge, and the uh, loop voltage is quite low, and it also has a good, uh, uh, I mean, prospect for the for the future uh, reactor uh, mode. The one of the issue here is we, as you can see, it's around, the, uh, around three seconds here, there is a collapse of the ITB due to the uh, MHD, but we can recover it quite uh, with the control of the, of the profile with the additional heating. So this, can, this kind of MHD mode, we, can, we have a knobs to control. So it, it can be, uh, translated to the future uh, reactor mode. We also, even though that right now the density is at a little bit low, so we, the next uh, uh, job we have to do is the increased density still sustaining the uh, internal transport barrier. So the, it, this is the in, uh, ITB for the ion temperature only. We don't see the clear uh, I, uh, ITB in the electron temperature and we are, uh, we use the upper singular, which means the unfavorable grad B drift direction, which will uh, limit the, the LH transition with the high power operation. So when you look at the put of the ITB, then it's really related with the uh, past ion populations. So we think that the, the, the load of the past ion in this mode is quite clear. So when you do the linear dielectric simulation to understand the, the basic mechanism, there is a uh, effect of the fast ion clearly, and also the electromagnetic stabilization, uh, stabilization factor is also present, and also the, the, the effect of the Chaplin shift, and also the delusion, uh, delusion of the thermal ion. So all of them actually uh, works together to decrease the linear growth rate uh, quite a lot. That we, is uh, the, the pay, uh, basic mechanism of the ITB formation we believe. And when you do the C gyro nonlinear simulation also predict the uh, reduction of the, uh, the heat flux quite significantly based on similar uh, mechanism. So this mode can be, could be applied to the future reactor mode uh, without any uh, severe MHD event in the edge and can be sustained uh, in, in long course with a high ion temperature uh, at the core. So the next topic is the MHD control. So KSTA is working on uh, very hard on the, the RMPM suppression. So we succeeded uh, uh, low end RMPM on control. And as you can see here, we can go down to the Q95 3.5 and even up to data similar shape. And also the, we have a, a, a fairly high beta level still sustained with the RMP. 
Here, one of the important uh, characteristic of K-star RMPM separation is we are, uh, it's, it's the 3D field spectrum. So, so what we call is edge localized RMP is the key to, for the M suppression and still we got the uh, improved the confinement still with the M suppression. So this uh, kind of a configuration is, is unique for K-star because it is possible, only it is only possible with, with the several lo colloidal loads of the, the RMP coil, otherwise uh, this optimization is uh, very difficult. So using the three rows of the RMP coil, employee coils, we are optimizing the RMP uh, amplitude in, at the edge, resonant component of the RMP amplitude at the edge, and, and still reducing the, the core component significantly. Then we are remove, uh, reducing the effect uh, of the of the core degradation from the RMP, but still we got successful M separation at the edge. So basically this is also predicted by, by the linear uh, 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 plasma response model. So as you can see here, the edge, and when you change the, uh, the, the RMP configuration, we can decrease the com uh, resonant component in the core significantly. Then we can, uh, if you use like lead-like configuration, still at the edge we have enough uh, RMP, uh, resonant component. Then this is ideal uh, spectrum we can have for the M suppression. So this is so called edge localized mode. So it has a lower impact on the past time transport, and so this uh, has a uh, reduced. Uh, uh, impact on the core degradation. So based on this technique and also the implying this some, some real-time adaptive uh, M control technique altogether, we can go to the higher beta normalized operation with the M suppression. And also we can get a long pulse M suppression up to 40 seconds, 30 or 40 seconds in the item figure. So, the, the, the control logic developed the K-star using the ERMP together with the adaptive control provide a, a good tool for the, for the long pulse uh, M suppression uh, is required for the, for the future reactors. So one of the uh, important implication of this low end uh, ERMP is uh, it provides a path to the express cell coil configuration, which will which would survive in reactive environment. So people understand that the imbecile control coil is a kind of nightmare for the reactor conditions. So that's why I want to move it outside. However, without this kind of technique, the, there, there is a strong, I mean, legend component in the core also. So it's not so ideal. But when we apply this kind of uh, uh, ERMP configuration successfully, then there is a chance to use this expressor coil configuration and uh, with a successful suppression of, of edge localized modes. So these are the older uh, uh, collaboration work for, for in this regard to searching for the, for the possibility of this expressor uh, coil configuration. And for the disruption, so we do have a, a multiple uh, pellet injectors and we realize that the uh, uh, very synchronized within the uh, uh, pre summer pinch uh, time, then the, they are synergetic effect. So it is very important to uh, shut the uh, multiple pellet within a certain time range and can be assimilated uh, very similarly with the uh, with the high temperature plasma. So then we will have a, a strong impact on the on the current uh, uh, the density rise and also the the poloidal and toroidal asymmetry. So this uh, is a uh, fairly good news for the ETA operation because ETA is using multiple pellet at the same time. So the uh, the proper I mean tuning of the of the timing provide the, the, the predicted performance of the ETA disruption mitigation system. 
and for the fundamental processes. So I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, the very old problem, so-called uh, self-organization in the electron temperature in the L-mode plasma. So it leads to the uh, major scale structure uh, with the uh, electron temperature corrugation, as you can see here. So we don't, we, there is a, a, a prediction of, of this phenomena by the uh, gyrokinetic simulation, but uh, finally k has succeeded in, in, in the measurement of this structure. As you can see here in, in the 2D imaging diagnostic, you can see the, the major scale structure here, profile corrugation. And uh, it, we, we found that the uh, step size is following the, the typical plateau-like distribution. So we are quite clear. We are quite sure that the, what we may actually measure is the, is the uh, electron temperature corrugation, which is predicted by the simulation. So we are. So this is per, uh, kind of a good uh, experimental validation of the ongoing simulation. Uh, with, with a good agreement. And for the turbulent spreading, Professor Ida already mentioned the, the, this uh, uh, physics, and uh, we found that the, the, this turbulent spreading around the magnetic island, it's actually the rapid heat transport across the magnetic island and uh, promote the reconstruct, uh, reconnection inside island. That could help the the open opening the magnetic island and which, which can go to the uh, disruption. So when we look at the case star da disruption data, there, there are certain level of the minor disruption. So it also always uh, related with the increase of the uh, temperature fluctuation and it actually helps the, the minor disruption happens. So we we think that uh, this turbulent spreading is an important mechanism for the, uh, the uh, disruption uh, event uh, near the uh, magnetic island. So finally, this is the uh, density pump out. So we all know that the density pump out is quite mysterious, I, I mean, phenomena. We, we understand the M suppression, but density pump out is uh, another thing. And when you look at the case data, there are, there are multiple steps of the density pump out. And uh, many people think that it is, it is only the resonant component important, important for this, this uh, phenomena, but we realize that uh, this is not that simple. And when you include, a, 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 the, for the nonlinear MH code JOREC, so we include uh, this MHD resonant component uh, also the plasma component and both the and also the uh, neoclassical uh, tro neoclassical viscosity effect, which is is non-resonant but has a strong impact on the rotation and the, and the particle transport. So if you include these two successfully, uh, 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 relevantly, then we can reproduce what we measure from the experiment uh, in good agreement, as you can see here. So. Finally, we think that it is related with uh, different uh, dense, uh, pump out correspond to different uh, Q95 surface and in sequence. So it is, uh, uh, we think that it's, uh, it's in good, good agreement with what we measure at k right now. And finally, I will briefly uh, uh, explain the, what we are going to do in, in this virtual pl platform development. So we actually developed the virtual case star, so-called, uh, there is a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, application for this model. Uh, it, it's coming from the very uh, uh, simple simulation, but also but to the, uh, first up to the first principle simulation altogether. And also we, have a real-time monitoring system for the machine operation included already. And we will use this platform for the fusion flight simulator and also the inclusion of the synthet synthetic diagnostics to all of the 
the, the physics and engineering part will be included, integrated in this platform to understand uh, better for the, what's going on in, in this complex system. So this is the summary. So as I mentioned before, we have you found the several can, good candidates for the, for the scenario and can be, I mean, extrapolated to the uh, reactor uh, relevant condition. And also we found the uh, Nobel control technique, uh, so-called ERMP and the multiple pellet, shattered pellet injector, which is uh, uh, urgent issue for the ITER uh, uh, baseline operation. And we are going, we are providing the key physics, uh, uh, understanding funda uh, fundamental physics, and I mean the uh, self-organization in the electron temperature and the turbulence splitting, and also the density pump power. It, it is, uh, uh, there is a, a measurement and the simulation all together to, you know, in a good shape for each topics, I believe. Of course, we, have, we need more, I mean, uh, this uh, uh, analysis to understand further, but uh, for the moment, there is a fairly good agreement right now. And we have a virtual platform uh, development. Okay, so this is the, all I have. And uh, stay tuned with KSA. And uh, we have uh, more uh, heating systems are coming and the new uh, tungsten monobular cassette, which is, is the ether class. So, and also the new uh, current drive system, so-called uh, helicon current drive. And then we are going, we are going to move on to the uh, uh, even higher, uh, better with the longer person scenario development with uh, uh, MHD control together. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ziwad, for sharing uh, these results with us. So now we welcome our final speaker, Dr. David Gates, Chief Technology Officer at Princeton Stellators Incorporated. Okay, uh, thank you, Mateo. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, I switched to a different microphone, so I just wanna make sure it's still working. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I think someone needs to stop sharing first. There you go. I think that's okay. Can you see my screen? Um, yes. Yes. Now it's full screen. Thank you. Okay. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, using arrays of simple dipoles to simplify stellarators. Um, for those of you who know me, um, I am now on leave at, from Princeton Plasma Physics Lab as of uh, this month. So and we have a, a new company called Princeton Sellers Incorporated, which um, has been in operation for a few months now. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about our, our goals and our plans and sort of how we got to this point. So just to remind people what, what Stellarators um, have that make them advantageous. Um, in particular, they don't have current, right? So we don't have to drive current. And that's really important if you're looking to build reactors. Um, current drive in reactors is expensive. Um, it requires recirculating power. Um, eddy currents from the current drive can induce uh, heating into important components that need to be cooled. Um, so for, for efficiency, stellarators um, are a very good idea. Uh, and if you look at these two pictures, I think um, you know a lot of people have identified um, the magnets as a big issue for stellarators. They're, they're not simple. Um, or haven't been to date. Um, and I think that's an issue that we've been trying to address now for some time, looking at alternative ways of constructing stellarators. Um, <clears throat> so just to remind people how uh, stellarators have been designed in recent times, um, there's been a great deal of progress in optimizing the stellarator equilibrium to have good neoclassical confinement. Um, that's an idea that go goes back to the 80s. And then a method to build the coils that give you those configurations uh, was developed uh, in the 19, late 1980s by uh, Peter Merkel. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a straightforward procedure, but it's, um, it leads to coils that, that haven't always had the best uh, control over their shape. 
So you end up def defining a shape that's based on um, the equilibrium you're trying to create. So in the, the process is that you define your optimized equilibrium, which is uh, done through some physics optimization code. There are several of them around the world that, that do this. Uh, they, you know, you can put in various physics criteria for what you're trying to optimize. Particularly, you can usually people optimize for neoclassical confinement, which has been the historical Achilles heel of stellarators. And that's been shown to work. I mean, that process does work. W7X has shown improved neoclassical confinement for, for ions uh, and unambiguously. Uh, that was a very uh, major achievement in, in recent times. Um, they can also be optimized for MHD stability and various other fast particle confinement, various other uh, parameters that might be chosen to be optimized. It can also uh, design diverters. So to, to make the equilibrium that you've now uh, defined through physics parameters, uh, the process is that you create usually what's called a winding surface. There are various methods, but this, this is the first method and it's the basic method that's still used um, for most stellarator designs. Um, so you create what's called a winding surface where the coils are gonna sit. And on that winding surface, you um, use the virtual casing theorem to um, create fields that set the normal component of the field to be zero on the last closed flux surface. Um, this is a requirement, of course, you know, normal fields don't exist on flux surfaces if they're actually flux surfaces. Um, there's usually at least one other constraint requirement is that you match the toroidal flux or, or a similar constraint that gives you the right value of the, so you don't get the trivial solution of B equals zero. That's not a very nice solution. Um, and then, you know, using the virtual casing theorem, you come up to the current uh, potential on that surface that you've defined. Um, and this is actually the, the figures from Merkel's paper. The, the top figure there is the potential, current potential, uh, that's for one period. Um, and then those current potential lines are the starting point for a, a more complex optimization that involves you know, coils with finite thickness and extent and finite current density. Um, and, but when you end up with what looks at what's on the bottom there, which is, this is an early W7X-like configuration from the 1980s. Um, there are further optimizations of the coils here that, that take into account the, the, the realistic um, requirements for building things. They can't, the coils can't go through each other. They have to be, uh, there's a radius of curvature constraint. You can't bend conductors at arbitrary angles. Um, but you end up with coils that look, that look like the things on the bottom right. Um, recently, um, uh, per Hellander visited PPPL and was talking to Mike Sarnsdorf about um, other ways to build stellarators. And this actually, <laughs> it's a good story, so I'm going to tell it. Mike was building um, a, a high school science project with his his son, and he wanted uh, his son wanted to build a rail gun, if if you know what that is. Um, and they decided for the the high school science project, it wasn't really plausible to use. Uh, to use, you know, electromagnets because it was going to be too expensive, but permanent magnets are quite inexpensive, and so and they actually make uh, amazingly high fields in modern permanent magnets. So he had the idea of making um, shaping fields with permanent magnets. So um, and Pear and Steve Cowley um, and Michael Drevlock at IPP got very excited about this idea and wrote a PRL showing that that this is actually plausible. Um, and in the meantime, so th this is this is a figure from that um, that paper. Uh, the the method is actually essentially identical. The difference is that um, permanent magnets can't make toroidal fields. Um, you can show that. That's a one line proof that you know Ampere's law says that if you want a field that goes around the long way around the torus, there has to be a current up through the middle. Um, but you you subtract off a toroidal component of the field, and you end up with uh, contours that instead of looking like these closed wiggly contours are um, actually uh, closed contours in the plane. They don't in encircle the, the torus any longer in the poloidal direction. And you get these helical stripes of, of required additional field. Um, 
and 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 the the numbers here are 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 plausible. Um, you can actually fairly easily show that that um, you can generate the fields you need using um, just definitions of magnetism. I won't go through this in any detail. Um, I, I point you to Pear's paper. Um, it's a very it's a very nice proof. Um, but you can show that uh, um, surface currents and magnetic dipoles uh, can give you these solutions. Just an example of what that looks like. This is the the first calculation you do. You look at you know define the winding surface where the dipoles will lie. It's not really a winding surface anymore with permanent magnets. It's more of a mounting surface. <clears throat> and you can work out the current potential you need with. This is actually what we did for. Um, uh, hypothesized experiment at PPPL where we used the toroidal field coils that were originally built for the NCSX project and uh, mounted permanent, imagine mounting permanent magnets on the vacuum vessel surface. Um, this is the you know, zero thickness version of that. Um, so a, a code was developed, I should acknowledge Chao Zhang Zhu who, who did most of the work I'm gonna show you in the next couple slides. Um, and you, you know the color here is um, the direction of the magnetic dipole is red in and blue out, or maybe it's the other way around. I'm not totally sure, but um, <clears throat> uh, and you can see that that you know they make nice helical uh, stripes of uh, of magnetic moment, or in this case, current potential, which are directly relatable to each other. Fairly quickly, you know, I mean, there's been a series of papers um, by Chao Zhang Zhu and, and Ken Hammond. Um, this is a, a figure from one of Chao Zhang's papers looking at using um, normal directed uh, magnetic moments. Um, this is still not quite realistic. It's these are perfectly stacked. There's no support structure. Um, there's a, but there's also a series of papers that include, you know, leaving gaps for for steel to hold things and glue. Um, but you can actually find many, many solutions to this problem. Um, in fact, I think you can prove that there's an infinite number of solutions to this problem. Um, but uh, it seemed like we should probably find a realistic solution. So we made a proposal to RPE. Um, the goal was to demonstrate a permanent magnet design that was constructible um, with sufficient field accuracy to make the, the target equilibrium. <clears throat> There's a series of additional papers that will be coming out on this, looking at errors and material, uh, real material properties. And, and uh, it turns out when you buy a magnet, the, the magnetic moment's not perfectly aligned. It's off by some manufacturing error. And we included all those variations uh, with stochastic projections. But um, we named the project PM for Stell. Um, and we uh, had a goal of building a half period magnet block. Um, we have completed the final design. Um, PPL also was actually interested in looking at what it would take to build such a device, um, which was run as a separate project. Um, reusing some components of the vacuum vessel and the turtle field coils. Um, and so it was based around the, the vacuum vessel for NCSX was completed. So we based the design around that. Um, and this TF coil set had a field on axis of a half a Tesla. Um, so this was a design with realistic parameters. And we had real steel support structures. Um, we had an assembly method. Um, that, that project um, was obviated by the realization that we can extend this idea to superconducting dipole arrays. So rather than using just permanent magnets, um, which have limited field generation capability, we can build um, you know, dipole coils that are mounted on the same vessel surface um, or maybe further back, um, but with effectively no limit on the field that can be generated uh, relative to the toroidal field, because you're going to use the same, same material to build the dipole coils as you use to build the toroidal coils. And um, of course, there's a much smaller requirement on these, on the dipole coils, and then the toroidal field is, you know, dominantly the, the main field. And so the idea here is that um, small coils mounted on panels that are demountable. This actually creates both a control scheme 
and a maintenance maintenance scheme for Stellar Raiders, which um, has always been a bit of an issue. You know, with with complex modular coils, it's hard to imagine um, large sector maintenance like in a tokamak. But um, by mounting these uh, dipoles on panels, we should be able to get a large sector access. Um, and um, so this patented concept uh, led to a spin-out company, which I'm now uh, have joined. Um, several other things have made this idea really attractive. Um, there's been a lot of uh, work um, on optimizing equilibria. Um, in particular, um, work done by Matt Lenderman and Elizabeth Paul. Uh, Elizabeth is a I don't think she's quite gotten there yet, but she was a postdoc at uh, at Princeton and is now uh, going to be a a professor at Columbia. Matt's, of course, uh, at University of Maryland. Um, but there's a, been a lot of work, and this is funded by the Simons Foundation uh, in large part through a, a project called the Hidden Symmetries uh, Activity. Um, and the idea is to make better stellarator equilibria. And this this equilibria is from a paper by um, Matt and Elizabeth. Um, and they achieve uh, you know, quasi-symmetry under the order of 10 to the minus 6. So you know, the theoretical existence of these equilibria is now established. Um, the particular focus of this article is to demonstrate um, excellent fast particle confinement. So um, fast particles are controlled and confined sufficiently for really for a reactor, um, in, in a theoretical sense anyways. Um, and you know, I think, uh, you know, this, these simpler and more accurate equilibria um, allow for uh, imagining a, a stellar reactor that actually is substantially easier to uh, operate and sustain. And this, this should lead to lower cost for construction as well. So this idea, I mean, the thing on the right is a cartoon when I'm comparing it to things on the left, which are not cartoons, but I think you can get the idea here. Um, you know, the, the coils on the left, those are of W7X, um, HSX is in the University of Wisconsin, NCSX, um, the coils were completed but never assembled. Um, you know, I, I don't really think you need to look very hard to see the complexity in the coil set. Um, but also there, there's a real implications of that complexity because it's not just complexity, it's highly precise complexity which means that those coils are uh, very complex shapes, but they have to be accurate to very high precision. Um, this has been done. Um, it's not impossible, but it's sometimes just because you can do something, maybe it's not the best idea to do it that way. Um, you know, and I think the idea on the, on the right, we've taken the complexity out of the shape of the coil and put it now into a 3D uh, current distribution on a surface. So each of those individual small dipoles um, has a different current through it. So I've taken the complexity out of the, the, the coils and put it into um, basically a control system. Um, it, you know, in fairness, I think, the, you know, when these uh, objects were designed, the idea of a control system that independently controlled a 500 uh, dipole coils would have been pretty hard to imagine. Um, but in a modern sense, uh, controlling large numbers of identical objects is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, a lot of this is not in the design and in the control scheme, really it comes down to imp improved computer power so that we can imagine doing such things. Um, also, you know, the existence of high current densities uh, superconductors will uh, make this much easier to achieve as well. And of course, high temperature will lead to lower power consumption. So our company's goal here is to, to build um, a first generation fusion system. It'll be completely prototypical of a power plant. We'll do DD fusion only. We'll be aiming at being target. And the idea is to generate a neutron source um, and demonstrate the real advantages of stellarators this way. Well, we can show that we have the fast particle confinement that's predicted theoretically now. Um, we can use modern technology negative ion neutral beams, uh, which are, have been in use for some time now, but nobody's ever really looked at optimizing them as neutron generators. So we're going to run at the, near the peak of the deuterium-deuterium 
fusion cross section and make a DD neutron source. The idea here, this device will have a blanket. Um, it'll be a tritium generation blanket. Uh, so it, it will be also prototypical in that sense. We'll be able to um, generate, we want to use this and generate some electricity. It won't be a net generation of electricity, but a complete prototype of a complete fusion power plant. And take, you know, and really demonstrate that we can run for days on end with, um, with heat generation. We have, we'll have a, a source for revenue. We can sell the rest of the fusion program tritium. Of course, we'd like to sell it to ourselves for our own electrical power plant. Um, but also this device could be used for making um, medical isotopes. So this is our near term commercialization. We're gonna run at fields that have been used in the past, high, higher fields than accelerators have ever achieved. Um, we're gonna aim at you know, six Tesla. And this will allow us to take advantage of uh, commercial development of uh, eater like gyrotrons. Um, you can now order those. I mean, you can just purchase them for there's an, another company that's been developed that will sell you a 170 gigahertz gyrotron and run those also in steady state. So the idea here is to um, have a near-term generation of, of revenue, um, you know, on a time scale that's interesting to, to venture capitalists that really do care about you having a product. I just want to make a quick um, shout out to my co-founders. Um, we're running this as a business. Um, I, I am not the CEO. Uh, I have no training as a CEO. I'm going to be in charge of the technology development. I have actual real business people as my partners. Um, you know, I really want to, Matt Miller, who um, was a co-founder of the Stellar Energy Foundation, helped us get going. He stepped into the president and chairman of the board role. And I have a very uh, capable and energetic um, partner in Brian Burson as the CEO. And I finished a little bit early, but I think that's probably okay. People have been listening to an hour and a half of talks already. Um, so, uh, thanks for your attention. And thank you, Dave, also for saving and saving some time for questions. Uh, we have some questions coming. I'm going to stop sharing real quick here. So can... Okay. So thank you all again. Um, so I invite the attendees to put the questions on the chat as they are already, and I'm, I'm going to go through them mostly as they as they get typed. I uh, will go back to um, Ida san. There was a question for LHT. Um, They're asking if um, radio frequency heating has ever been used to control instabilities. Ida san? Yes, uh, sorry. Um, what is the question there? Using the uh, ICR or for? I cannot hear you. Um, can you hear my voice? Yes. Thank you. Did you see the question on the RF eating? It, the question is ICR or RF? What, what RF will be issued to ICRF? Not specified. So uh, how can I see a question think... by chat or I is a yeah. way to look just the... click the chat then you can see the see the questions. Yes, I did. I click the chat, but uh... oh. Okay, so while, while you go through the chat, uh, you will find there's the question about, uh, it's it's basically the first question you'll see at 326. The first question, the first yeah. question is? I have uh, a theory that a certain type of electromagnetic signal can be used yeah. in RF heating to control the turbulence in the plasma. Has radio frequency heating ever been used to control instabilities in LHD? Oh, okay, okay. Um, 
as RF heating has been used to control the instability. Um, which instability talking about? It, it's not quite clear. Um, we we can move ahead for now. Uh, Dave, uh, I'll come to you. Um, do you? They were asking if you know exactly what medical isotope you guys are going to focus on for production. So um, just to be clear, we're not. Uh, we we're going to provide a neutron source. Um, we've had some discussions with companies that have expertise in generating molybdenum ninety nine. Is in fact the the most. It's the biggest market. Um, but the process is actually fairly complex to 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 generate molybdenum 99 and then purify it and it has to be done very quickly because it decays very fast so um our our, our model would be that we uh, design and build the neutron source and you know offer space uh in on the machine to do this work we would go to a, a company that has that expertise um it's it's uh, i've i I know enough about it to know that I think I don't know how to do it. Um, there, there's a, but there are companies out there that already do molybdenum 99 generation, but we can produce neutrons, I think, much more effectively and much more cheaply than other methods. Um, to be precise, I mean, and it's really all this new technology that makes that possible. We can get high electron temperature in a relatively small volume, inject fairly high energy uh, deuterons, and get a, a, we estimate a 10 to the 18th per second neutron generation, which is on the order of, you know, fission reactors. Um, it turns out optimizing the device to generate DD neutrons really isn't something people are focused on. They, they typically wanted to have high ion temp thermal ion temperatures, which isn't really a requirement for beam target. What you really want is high electron temperature for beam target, so. They were also asking if there's any, I mean, this is going to be a pure fusion system. Is there any plan for a... I don't, I mean, it's a possibility. Um, it's always been kind of my point of view that um, that fusion is really the, the my, it's my goal. I want to make fusion energy, not fission energy. Um, you know, I wouldn't rule that out as something this machine can do if somebody else wants to do it, but it's not something I, first off, I don't have any expertise in, in generating... Uh, what did they want to make? Basically, they were asking if you would thorium or depleted yeah, uranium. Make it out of it a fusion fission hybrid system. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you know one of the attractions of a pure fusion system that it doesn't have any. It has much reduced uh, proliferation risk, and I mean, obviously, this would undo that. I think so. Um, yeah, I think that would. It's not my target. But in the you didn't specify any timeline. I don't know if you can, can you tell us a little bit more? Cause so really a target of building this uh, neutron source, which is our prototype uh, reactor uh, in five years. Um, there's nothing, since we're not challenging any engineering boundaries, we're aiming at six Tesla, it's been done. We're aiming at um, using commercially available gyotrons. We want to, um, we actually want to downsize negative ion neutral beams right now. We, we want low power, um, you know, a couple of megawatts of uh, NNBI will go a long way. Um, we're not, we think that that's all doable in a very short term. Um, we have some technology demonstrations to do in the near term using uh, presumably HTS superconducting magnets uh, that are coupled in strong ways. Um, and the, then we can go ahead and just build this. Now, they're, they're, the big issue here will be supply chain, I think. I mean, we'll have to, you know, but the, the HTS industry actually has very aggressive plans for increasing the availability of uh, HTS tapes. And we've looked into this. We think it's plausible, that timeline. Okay, thank you. Um... There was a question about how would the permanent magnets behave under extreme conditions? So permanent magnets, um, much like superconductors, the permanent magnets would have to be behind shields and blankets so that they don't get neutron flux. Um, so, because 
neither superconductors nor permanent magnets want to really see neutron flux. Um, the neodymium permanent magnets are actually extremely robust um, permanent magnets. They're almost ideal. Uh, it's, I was really impressed, actually. I did quite, I learned quite a bit doing this project. I had never really worked with permanent magnets before. Um, the key thing is to, there's two issues. One is the total field you can make, which is called the, um, you know, the res residual field. And then there's the, what's called the coercivity, which is what it takes to demagnetize the magnet. And it turns out if you cool neodymium magnets to you know, even liquid nitrogen temperatures, they have extremely high coercivity. Um, you can use them in fields up to uh, eight or nine Tesla. So um, now that said, it, you know, it's not easy to work the, with things that have that much f inherent field on them. Um, it's really, forces are quite substantial. So assembly is not a small task. Um, a lot of the appeal of moving to superconducting dipoles as opposed to permanent magnet dipoles is that, you know, really the limit on the field I can generate from a superconducting dipole is the same as the field I can generate using the, the total field coils. So that there, there's no, you know, mismatch in the total field you can generate. Okay, so there's a question, there's a quite long question you'll see in the chat. If you if you had the time to read it, I'll come back to you. And um, Ida-san, now I think uh, the person who had asked you the question brought more on the chat. So if you could probably, if you could possibly also read that and then I'll ask you again. Mm. Meanwhile, I ask a question to Seawall because I was, uh, I was curious to know, do you think, how would you see a possible collaboration with international part partners on the simulation platform, on the virtual simulator, on the flight simulator, on this uh, uh, project for integrating uh, physics and technology? How would you, how do you think, how would you picture a possible collaboration in this area with international? Yes. I mean, yeah, it's just virtual. So every, every country, I think, has uh, its own plan to develop uh, this virtual system. And uh, I believe that the, the, the most important part is the, 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 the basic engine. It's a, it's, it's from the game industry. I mean, the graphical user interface and all the, all the things. So we have many things in common in, in game, I mean, business. And also the, because uh, this platform actually integrated uh, many things starting from the synthetic diagnostics. So we have a, there is a certain level of development in USA for, for this technique. And also we need a very sophisticated first principle uh, simulation toolkit also. So maybe we can uh, collaborate with, uh, with the other institution for the, the, the very fundamental gyrokinetic simulate, simulator and transport it to the to the virtual system and the integration, all the integration. So there is plenty of, uh, of control collaboration uh, point here. So, but up to now, its development is, is, is domestic, basically. So we are building a, a, a basic blocks right now. Maybe we can add up the additional parts from the, the other countries. So this is, um, I mean, uh, a uh, very interesting topic to collaborate with, with, with other countries, I think, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Ida-san, do you? Yes, I read the uh, additional uh, questions and uh, um, usually the RF heating, uh, for the heating is the uh, big energy source in the, fusion devices and that creating uh, um, the so-called the, uh, the temperature gradient and that temperature gradient drive a lot of the instability and the turbulence. So uh, that is the main uh, effect of uh, heating or RF wave. And we do not see a much uh, effect of RF uh, stabilization of the turbulence by RF. In other words, 
RF is kind of the source of the turbulence rather than the uh, control the instability. Of course, one of the idea is once the RF, um, we apply the RF, RF uh, will create the uh, so-called energetic particle. And the energetic particle has some uh, contribution to stabilize the uh, turbulence. That is also the uh, presented in the case study. So I think uh, there is a somewhat indirect effect of uh, stabilization or effect on the turbulence, but there is no uh, direct uh, turbulence uh, control by RF wave. Okay, thank you. So Dave, now uh, asking those questions, I'll read them just so that uh, everyone can, can hear the question. Uh, so the question was, will the resulting, resulting field produced by the dipole coils give non-optimal -opti particle impingement onto the first wall diverter? And will the dipole field lines intersect the plasma phasing components and the small glancing angles that are currently used to decrease the heat flux density? So, yeah, it's a very... Uh... I mean, it's a good question. It's a, it's a very detailed <laughs> calculation that needs to be done there. Um, we haven't, I mean, we haven't done that calculation yet. We're designing the, you know, sort of the bulk field uh, elements. Um, you know, I think this is a question for essentially any fusion device, right? Can you protect the first wall from fast particles? Um, and I, I, I have my ideas for how to deal with that problem. I think, um, you know, even ITER has difficulty with a possible fast particle loss due to alphane waves or the ELM control uh, perturbations that, you know, come from the, the, the ELM control coils. So, um, you know, I think this is an area where we, the, the, the whole fusion community needs to really decide how to deal with fast particle loss um, near the wall. Um, we will look at this problem, but it's not our first, our first design activity. Okay, thank you very much for answering. Uh, I don't see any other question, I think, um, on the chat. So I think we can close it here for today. <laughs> thank you all again for your time and for the great presentations. And uh, thank you all for participants for staying with us. Well, thank and, uh, you for the invitation. <laughs> thank you. See you next much. time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.